Well, I'm delighted to be joined by sports psychotherapist and vastly experienced broadcaster Gary Bloom for a sporting lockdown chat. Gary, thanks very much for your time. Pleasure, and thank you for inviting me onto this podcast. Gary, it's an extraordinary time, as we know. Uh, footballers, other athletes preparing their mental approach uh, and their capacity to return to competition in very different circumstances to those that they're accustomed. I'd imagine that your services are in much demand at the moment. Yes, it, it's certainly we've certainly seen an upturn in our services, um, people requesting our services, but that's right across the board in terms of what we might call traditional clients, but also sports clients as well. I think one of the greatest problems that we're trying to get to grips with is the lack of socialization, especially in football teams. Um, imagine you were taken away from your job and asked to rejoin your colleagues in about two months' time. It's really hard. And, you know, the lockdown obviously means we are working remotely. But footballers in particular and, and people from sports teams, they need that day-to-day socialization. A lot of them thrive on it. And one client said to me, uh, he's coming to the end of his contract um, uh, the 30th of June, said, look, don't say anything to the gaffer. He said, but I play for nothing for this this club. Uh, you know, I just love being with the lads. I love all the the crack, all the dressing room banter. You take that away, it's really hard. And it's really hard. And if you think about that for professional players, I was dealing this week with um, the head of an academy of a Premier League club. And he just said, look, think about the academy players. Some of those lads are not going to be required till October time at the, the earliest so this sense of dislocation is is huge, and it's something that we are going to have to deal with. Maybe not so much now, but certainly when the lockdown ends and people are back out there again, the football season could be over, could be voided. What are players going to do then? They haven't seen their pals, haven't seen their teammates for a while. Gary, what are the biggest challenges that you see at this moment in time? Of course, everybody deals with situations differently, and their mental approach to matters are very, very different, and I'm sure you... Uh, deal with players on their own individual um, characteristics. But what are the biggest challenges? And are those challenges different for players at different levels of the professional game? That's a really good question. The answer is um, every player is different. And let me give you, for instance, if you're at home with your wife and kids uh, and really enjoying that time, family time in lockdown, that might be a very different experience to say somebody I'm dealing with who's uh, an overseas player who comes from a European country, who's playing in the UK, his mum and dad are hundreds of miles away in a country that's had a particularly bad coronavirus uh, outbreak, uh, and he's on his own. So the, 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 the difference between those two is, is huge, but actually up and down the leagues, those stories don't really vary. But the individual circumstances of every individual will vary. And if you live alone and you're watching this uh, this recording, it's going to be very different if you're with your mum and your dad or your wife and your kids. We all have different experiences during the lockdown. And I go back to my previous answer. This is about socialization. We are social animals. We're meant to meet and greet and have busy social lives. And very often when I deal with um, the everyday clients I deal with, one of the big, big noticeable things dealing with a client who's suffering from, say, depression or anxiety is they don't have a wide circle of friends. And the first thing I often say to those people is, look, you need to widen that circle of friends, socialise more, feel connected. It's something that I hadn't have thought of until you uh, said it in your previous answer about the anxieties of players at a particular level of the game that may be coming to the end of their contract and because of this pandemic actually may never kick a professional football again. Yeah, I've got a few clients who are saying, you know, I've played for a club. We've done quite well this season. My contract's up. Remember, in League One and League Two especially, less so in the Championship and Premier League, there's very few contracts longer than two years. So everybody's contract is either expiring now or in a year's time. So there's a high proportion of turnover of staff at those clubs. So um, many of those players might be on loan from a different club. And therefore, they're back in their hometown or home city is thinking... Is that it now? And when am I going to play next season? And should I talk to my agent? And what should I say to my agent? Am I, am I available? And the clubs they've been playing for who don't know their status next season can't make them offers. So we're in this complete lockdown in terms of transfers as well. And it's very, very disquieting for those individuals. They're uh, under 
the lockdown, they're with people they wouldn't normally live with 24-7. And you can see now the social situation for many people being really, really tricky. We've seen that the Bundesliga will or is set to return towards the end of May. Premier League is obviously hoping to ramp up training and then potentially get back in to competition. In terms of individual players, and again, it's different at all levels in terms of uh, salary and wealth and riches and rewards, but some things remain constant, and that is that professional footballers, athletes also have families at home, and there will be anxieties, mental anxieties, about embracing uh, the world outside of lockdown and obviously potentially going back to family, friends and loved ones. Is that an anxiety that you've heard? Yes, um, I think this is a really um, undiscovered territory in professional sport, because while some of the clubs are saying, yeah, we can't wait to get back and we want to play football, talk to some of the individual players, maybe players whose wives are pregnant, who are in vulnerable positions, people with parents who might be sick, who have underlying health conditions. It's not as black and white as I think the media are making out. People have real concerns about going back into what they would describe as unsafe situations, especially if going back into a situation where you could carry the virus back into your family. So I'm not sure it's as black and white as people make out that everybody's desperate to play football again. That's not what I'm hearing. I know that you deal a lot with athletes, sportsmen and women, but some of the custodians of the game, and I'm thinking of people that run football clubs, not only at Premier League level, but I'm thinking of uh, the chairman and owners of League One and League Two, where margins are very tight and being out of the game at the moment is costing them a lot of money when sometimes they'll only break even at best. The anxieties for people who run the game must be great as well. Well, I think there has been a growing realisation over lockdown that League One and League Two just can't return. Because whereas a championship club, if you're a Leeds or a West Brom or a huge club like Forest, you can put these matches online, play them in empty stadium, and the revenue that you would get from pay-per-view online would make it sensible. There is revenue coming in. If you're a Burton or an Accrington Stanley, it doesn't add up. And if you're a mid-table and you've got nothing ready to play for, and there's no relegation and no promotion, what, what on earth is the point in paying players, paying medical staff, paying, pay, paying social, uh, paying first-team staff, why would you go to all that expense on putting on a football match that doesn't mean anything? You know, there's something in psychology called the short game and the long game. And the long game for football clubs is to still be around in 10 years' time. The short game might be to be promoted this season or not go down this season. So you have two different values acting against each other. And we all have our favourite football clubs. And I would say I would rather my football club be in existence in five years' time than worry about promotion and relegation this time around. Gary, can I just ask you, um, what are the potential techniques that you're employing with certain footballers, athletes, to overcome anxieties? I understand entirely that everybody's approaching it different and some will be very gung-ho and will be desperate to get back out on the field. Some will be more anxious and we've seen that with some of the athletes that we've seen uh, quoted in the media. Are there any techniques that apply to anxious sports people that potentially apply to the wider population? Well, all the usual things that you'll probably hear from people like me about well-being, about, you know, diet, exercise, sleep is huge, try to get regular sleep, um, hydration. Um, but actually, the there are very, very clear techniques that I have a, a programs in, in, in place that would help players come back to play at a high competitive level. You cannot expect a team, for example, like Liverpool, who were on the crest of a right wave, I know they lost a couple of games towards the end of their run, to come back and produce again as if nothing had happened. You have to have programs in place for players to rejoin the group, re-socialise, get fit again, and then it gets even weirder because you're asking to play them play those matches in empty stadia. So I would ask I'd be asking players to how do they think about 
playing in a very novel way. There's no crowd there. And the biggest thing when there's no crowd there is you can hear every voice. What, who, who motivates you when you've not got um, when you've not got a crowd? And I'll just put this in a bit of perspective. We would go into the psychology of an individual and say to them, why do you play sport? And there's usually two reasons. One, I love the game. And I'd fall into that category because I'm not a very good footballer, but I still play. And the other one is people actually enjoy being an entertainer. They actually enjoy the entertainment value of playing for professional sport in front of a big crowd. Now, we would have to look at the entertainers in the squad and work with them to help them understand that energy they would normally get from playing in front of a crowd just isn't going to be there. So how do you motivate yourself? How do you get up for those big moments, especially, for example, if the football authorities decide to go back into what you might call a World Cup tournament situation where you're just playing playoffs? So the next match you could be playing could determine your season. That is a very specialised psychological preparation. Gary, just finally, uh, fascinated uh, about the work that you do. And I know you do a lot of work with Oxford United and other uh, athletes and sportsmen and women. In your history uh, in the sports industry, uh, you are a highly accomplished sports broadcaster. Just tell us, if you can, I'm sure we could sit and talk for a long time, but just give us a snapshot of how you moved from one industry within the sports uh, area to the sports psychotherapist um, field, because it's quite a, it would appear to be quite a jump. I never planned it this way. Like all the best things that ever happened, Chris, I never planned it this way. As you know, as a sports reporter, a broadcaster, you have a lot of spare time on your hands. You know, most of our work is concentrated into weekends, covering matches or midweeks um, or studio sessions that were quite dotted around. Uh, and I got to the sort of stage in my life and I thought, I wonder what else I could do. Um, and very gradually, I began training as a psychotherapist, not thinking that it would ever in any way, shape or form involve sport. I thought I'd be dealing with uh, all the usual things psychotherapists deal with. So depression and anxiety and addictions. And then all of a sudden, I was invited to work for a clinic in London um, and because of my background in sport, they had certain uh, contracts with professional sports bodies like cricket bodies and rugby, uh, rugby bodies and football bodies. And they said, you'd be a great fit for your psychotherapy and the, our clients. And, you know, one day um, I was I didn't even know who was coming into the building. Uh, and they just said, Mr. So-and-so is ready, your new client. I'd never met him before. And they'd actually got the name of this person wrong. And it was a simple administrative slip. And then I went upstairs and said, um, you know, the name of somebody. And nobody looked up in the waiting room. I thought, that's odd. And there was a very, very famous Premier League manager there. And he looked at me and I looked at him. And I thought I, there was a couple of letters missing from the name that had been given to me wrongly. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting down with a Premier League manager. Um, and the, the story of his life had nothing to do with football. The, the, he'd come to see me about nothing connected with football whatsoever. So in a way, as a psychotherapist, although I'm a sports psychotherapist, a lot of the work is usual everyday stuff that you and I might suffer from. You know, um, bereavements, financial issues, uh, relationship issues, arguments with partners, mums and dads, all that sort of stuff. Um, but from there on in, my work with this uh, clinic brought me into the orbit of Oxford United. Uh, when I joined the club, they were bottom of League One. Um, it was an interesting time. The fans were chanting to the manager, you're getting sacked in the morning. And I remember going home after the first day and saying to my partner, I, I'm not even sure I can do this. I don't even know where to start. And thankfully, 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 through a very, very enlightened board of directors, a very enlightened managing director, head of the academy and a very, very enlightened manager in Carl Robinson. We've enjoyed some success. I'll put it that way. Gary, it's been uh, a real thrill and a pleasure to chat with you. Uh, good luck, stay safe and uh, we'll speak soon. You too, Chris. All the best. Thanks, Gary.